external surface of a high-speed aircraft. Typically, rivets are fabricated from aluminum alloys, such as 2017 T4, 2024 T4, 2117 T4, 7050, and 5056. Titanium, nickel-based alloys, such as mono corrosion-resistant steel, mild steel or iron, and copper rivets are also used for rivets in certain cases. Rivets are available in a wide variety of alloys, head shapes, and sizes and have a wide variety of uses in aircraft structure. Rivets that are satisfactory for one part of the aircraft are often unsatisfactory for another part. Therefore, it is important that an aircraft technician know the strength and driving properties of the various types of rivets and how to identify them, as well as how the driver install them. Solid rivets are classified by their head shape, by the material from which they are manufactured, and by their size. Identification codes used are derived from a combination of the military standard, MS, and National Aerospace Standard, NAS, systems, as well as an older classification system known as an for Army slash Navy. For example, the prefix MS identifies hardware that conforms to written military standards. A letter or letters following the head shape code identify the material or alloy from which the rivet was made. The alloy code is followed by two numbers separated by a dash. The first number is the numerator of a fraction, which specifies the shank diameter in 30 seconds of an inch. The second number is the numerator of a fraction in sixteenths of an inch, and identifies the length of the rivet. Rivet head shapes and their identifying code numbers are shown in figure 4-75. The most frequently used repair rivet is the AD rivet, because it can be installed in the received condition. Some rivet alloys, such as DD rivets, alloy 2024 T4, are too hard to drive in the received condition, and must be annealed, before they can be installed. Typically, these rivets are annealed and stored in the freezer to retard hardening, which has led to the nickname, MS2426 AD5-8, length in sixteenths of an inch, diameter in thirty seconds of an inch, material or alloy, 2117 T4, head shape, countersunk, Specification, military standard. Ice box rivets. They are removed from the freezer just prior to use. Most DD rivets have been replaced by E-type rivets which can be installed in the received condition. The head type, size, and strength required in a rivet are governed by such factors as the kind of forces present at the point riveted, the kind and thickness of the material to be riveted, and the location of the part on the aircraft. The type of head needed for a particular job is determined by where it is to be installed. Countersunk head rivets should be used where a smooth aerodynamic surface is required. Universal head rivets may be used in most other areas. The size, or diameter, of the selected rivet shank should correspond in general to the thickness of the material being riveted. If an excessively large rivet is used in a thin material, the force necessary to drive the rivet properly causes an undesirable bulging around the rivet head. On the other hand, if an excessively small rivet diameter is selected for thick material, the sheer strength of the rivet is not great enough to carry the load of the joint. As a general rule, the rivet diameter should be at least two and a half to three times the thickness of the thicker sheet. Rivets most commonly chosen in the assembly and repair of aircraft range from 332 inch to 38 inch in diameter. Ordinarily, rivets smaller than 332 inch in diameter are never used on any structural parts that carry stresses. The proper sized rivets to use for any repair can also be determined by referring to the rivets used by the manufacturer in the next parallel row inboard on the wing or forward on the fuselage. Another method of determining the size of rivets to be used is to multiply the skin's thickness by 3 and use the next larger size rivet corresponding to that figure. For example, if the skin is 0.040 inch thick, multiply 0.040 inch by 3 to get 0.120 inch and use the next larger size of rivet, 1.8 inch, 0.125 inch. When rivets are to pass completely through tubular members, select a rivet diameter equivalent to at least 1.8 the outside diameter of the tube. If one tube sleeves or fits over another, take the outside diameter of the outside tube and use any of that distance as the minimum rivet diameter. A good practice is to calculate the minimum rivet diameter and then use the next larger size rivet. Whenever possible, select rivets of the same alloy number as the material being riveted. For example, use 1103,003 rivets on parts fabricated from 1103,003 alloys, and 2117-1 and 2017-T rivets on parts fabricated from 2017 and 2024 alloys. Figure 4-75. Rivet head shapes and their identifying code numbers. 4-32. The size of the formed head is the visual standard of a proper rivet installation. The minimum and maximum sizes, as well as the ideal size, are shown in Figure 4-76. Installation of rivets. Repair layout. Repair layout involves determining the number of rivets required, the proper size and style of rivets to be used, their material, temper condition and strength, the size of the holes, the distances between the holes, and the distance between the holes, and the edges of the patch. Distances are measured in terms of rivet diameter. Rivet length. To determine the total length of a rivet to be installed, the combined thickness of the materials to be joined must first be known. This measurement is known as the grip length. The total length of the rivet equals the grip length plus the amount of rivet shank needed to form a proper shop head. 
the latter equals one and a half times the diameter of the rivet shank, where A is total rivet length, B is grip length, and C is the length of the material needed to form the shop head. This formula can be represented as A equals B plus C. Figure 4-76. Rivet strength. For structural applications, the strength of the replacement rivets is of primary importance. Figure 4-77 rivets made of material that is lower in strength should not be used as replacements unless the shortfall is made up by using a larger rivet. For example, a rivet of 2024 T4 aluminum alloy should not be replaced with one of 2117 T4 or 2017 T4 aluminum alloy unless the next larger size is used. The 2117 T rivet is used for general repair work, since it requires no heat treatment, is fairly soft and strong, and is highly corrosion resistant when used with most types of alloys. Always consult the maintenance manual for correct rivet type and material. The type of rivet head to select for a particular repair job can be determined by referring to the type used within the surrounding area by the manufacturer. Standard rivet alloy code markings. Alloy code A alloy 1100 or 3003 aluminum head marking none. Alloy code B alloy 5056 aluminum head marking raised cross. Shear strength 10 kilopounds per square inch. KSI, non-structural uses only. Alloy code AD alloy 2117 aluminum head marking dimple. Shear strength 28 KSI. Alloy code D alloy 2017 aluminum head marking raised dot. Driven rivet standards A, A, D, B, D, D rivets. 1.33 D, 1.5 D. Redrive protrusion. Formed head dimension. 0.66 D, 0.5 D, 0.33 D. Shear strength 30 KSI. 1.25 D, 1.5 D. 1.66 D. Minimum preferred maximum. D, E, P, M rivets. Alloy code D, D alloy 2024 aluminum head marking two bars, raised. 1.25 D 1.33 D. Redrive protrusion. Form head dimension. 0.66 D 0.6 D 0.5 D. 1.25 D 1.4 D 1.5 D. Minimum preferred maximum. Shear strength 41 KSI must be driven in W condition, icebox. Shear strength 38 KSI 38 KSI when driven is received 34 KSI when reheat treated. Alloy code E, key asterisk asterisk Boeing code. Alloy 7050 aluminum head marking raised ring. Shear strength 43 KSI replacement for DD rivet to be driven in T condition. Figure 4 76. Rivet form head dimensions. Figure 4 77. Rivet alloy strength. 4 33. A general rule to follow on the flush riveted aircraft is to apply flush rivets on the upper surface of the wing and stabilizers, on the lower leading edge back to the spar, and on the fuselage back to the high point of the wing. Use universal head rivets in all other surface areas. Whenever possible, select rivets of the same alloy number as the material being riveted. Stresses applied to rivets. Shear is one of the two stresses applied to rivets. The shear strength is the amount of force required to cut a rivet that holds two or more sheets of material together. If the rivet holds two parts, it is under single shear. If it holds three sheets or parts, it is under double shear. To determine the shear strength, the diameter of the rivet to be used must be found by multiplying the thickness of the skin material by three. For example, a material thickness of 0.040 inch multiplied by 3 equals 0.120 inch. In this case, the rivet diameter selected would be 180.125 inch. Tension is the other stress applied to rivets. The resistance to tension is called bearing strength and is the amount of tension required to pull a rivet through the edge of two sheets riveted together or to elongate the hole. Rivet spacing. Rivet spacing is measured between the center lines of rivets in the same row. The minimum spacing between protruding head rivets shall not be less than 312 times the rivet diameter. The minimum spacing between flush head rivets shall not be less than 4 times the diameter of the rivet. These dimensions may be used as the minimum spacing except when specified differently in a specific repair procedure or when replacing existing rivets. On most repairs, the general practice is to use the same rivet spacing and edge distance, distance from the center of the hole to the edge of the material that the manufacturer used in the area surrounding the damage. The SRM for the particular aircraft may also be consulted. Aside from this fundamental rule, there is no specific set of rules that governs spacing of rivets in all cases. However, there are certain minimum requirements that must be observed. When possible, rivet edge distance, rivet spacing, and distance between rows should be the same as that of the original installation. When new sections are to be added, the edge distance measured from the center of the rivet should never be less than two times the diameter of the shank. The distance between rivets or pits should be at least three times the diameter, and the distance between rivet rows should never be less than two one two times the diameter. Rivet spacing 6D distance between rows 6D. Rivet spacing 6D distance between rows 3D. Rivet spacing 4D distance between rows 4D. Figure 4-78. Acceptable rivet patterns. Figure 4-78 illustrates acceptable ways of laying out a rivet pattern for a repair. Edge distance. Edge distance, also called edge margin by some manufacturers, is the distance from the center of the first rivet to the edge of the sheet. 
it should not be less than 2 or more than 4 rivet diameters, and the recommended edge distance is about 212. Rivet diameters. The minimum edge distance for universal rivets is 2 times the diameter of the rivet. The minimum edge distance for countersunk rivets is 212 times the diameter of the rivet. If rivets are placed too close to the edge of the sheet, the sheet may crack or pull away from the rivets. If they are spaced too far from the edge, the sheet is likely to turn up at the edges. Figure 4-79 it is good practice to lay out the rivets a little further from the edge so that the rivet holes can be oversized without violating. Section AAEE. DD. Incorrect. Too close to edge E equals 1 and a half D. Correct D equals 2D. A. Resultant crack safe. Edge distance slash edge margin. Minimum edge distance. Preferred edge distance. Protruding head rivets counter sunk rivets. 2D 2 and a half D. 2D plus 1 slash 16 2 and a half D plus 1 slash 16. Figure 4 79. Minimum edge distance. 4 34. Rivet spacing minimum spacing preferred spacing. 1 and 3 rows protruding head rivet layout 2 row protruding head rivet layout 1 and 3 rows counter sunk head rivet layout 2 row counter sunk head rivet layout. 3D 4D 3 slash 1 slash 2D 4 slash 1 slash 2D. 3D plus 1 slash 16 4D plus 1 slash 16 3 slash 1 slash 2D plus 1 slash 16 4 slash 1 slash 2D plus 1 slash 16. Figure 4 80. Rivet spacing. The edge distance minimums. Add 1 16 inch to the minimum edge distance, or determine the edge distance using the next size of rivet diameter. Two methods for obtaining edge distance. The rivet diameter of a protruding head rivet is 332 inch. Multiply 2 times 332 inch to obtain the minimum edge distance. 316 inch. Add 1 16 inch to yield the preferred edge distance of 1 4 inch. The rivet diameter of a protruding head rivet is 332 inch. Select the next size of rivet, which is 1 8 inch. Calculate the edge distance by multiplying 2 times 1 8 inch to get 1 4 inch. Rivet pitch. Rivet pitch is the distance between the centers of neighboring rivets in the same row. The smallest allowable rivet pitch is 3 rivet diameters. The average rivet pitch usually ranges from 4 to 6 rivet diameters, although in some instances rivet pitch could be as large as 10 rivet diameters. Rivet spacing on parts that are subjected to bending moments is often closer to the minimum spacing to prevent buckling of the skin between the rivets. The minimum pitch also depends on the number of rows of rivets. 1 and 3 row layouts have a minimum pitch of 3 rivet diameters, a 2 row layout has a minimum pitch of 4 rivet diameters. The pitch for countersunk rivets is larger than for universal head rivets. If the rivet spacing is made at least 1 16 inch larger than the minimum, the rivet hole can be oversized without violating the minimum rivet spacing requirement. Figure 4 80. Transverse pitch. Transverse pitch is the perpendicular distance between rivet rows. It is usually 75% of the rivet pitch. The smallest allowable transverse pitch is 212 rivet diameters. The smallest allowable transverse pitch is 212 rivet diameters. Rivet pitch and transverse pitch often have the same dimension and are simply called rivet spacing. Rivet layout example. The general rules for rivet spacing, as it is applied to a straight row layout, are quite simple. In a one row layout, find the edge distance at each end of the row and then lay off the rivet pitch, distance between rivets, as shown in figure 4 81. In a two row layout, lay off the first row, place the second row a distance equal to the transverse pitch from the first row, and then lay off rivet spots in the second row so that they fall midway between those in the first row. In the three row layout, First lay off the first and third rows, then use a straight edge to determine the second row rivet spots. When splicing a damaged tube, and the rivets pass completely through the tube, space the rivets 4 to 7 rivet diameters apart if adjacent rivets are at right angles to each other, and space them 5 to 7 rivet diameters apart if the rivets are parallel to each other. The first rivet on each side of the joint should be no less than 2 1 2 rivet diameters from the end of the sleeve. Rivet pitch, 6 to 8 diameters. Edge distance, 2 to 2 1 slash 2 diameters. Single row layout. Transverse pitch, 75% of rivet pitch. 2 row layout. 3 row layout. Figure 4 81. Rivet layout. 4 35. Rivet installation tools. The various tools needed in the normal course of driving and upsetting rivets include drills, reamers, rivet cutters or nippers, bucking bars, riveting hammers, draw sets, dimpling dies or other types of countersinking equipment, rivet guns, and squeeze riveters. See clamps, vises, and other fasteners used to hold sheets together when riveting were discussed earlier in the chapter. Other tools and equipment needed in the installation of rivets are discussed in the following paragraphs. Hand tools. A variety of hand tools are used in the normal course of driving and upsetting rivets. They include rivet cutters, bucking bars, hand riveters, counter sinks, and dimpling tools. Rivet cutter. The rivet cutter is used to trim rivets when rivets of the required length are unavailable. Figure 4 82. To use the rotary rivet cutter, insert the rivet in the correct hole, place the required number of shims under the rivet head, and squeeze the cutter as if it were a pair of pliers. Rotation of the discs cuts the rivet to give the right length, which is determined by the number of shims inserted under the head. 
When using a large rivet cutter, place it in a vise, insert the rivet in the proper hole, and cut by pulling the handle, which shears off the rivet. If regular rivet cutters are not available, diagonal cutting pliers can be used as a substitute cutter. Bucking bar. The bucking bar, sometimes called a dolly, bucking iron, or bucking block, is a heavy chunk of steel whose counter vibration during installation contributes to proper rivet installation. They come in a variety of shapes and sizes, and their weights ranges from a few ounces to 8 or 10 pounds, depending upon the nature of the work. Bucking bars are most often made from low carbon steel that has been case hardened or alloy bar stock. Those made of better grades of steel last longer and require less reconditioning. Bucking faces must be hard enough to resist indentation and remain smooth, but not hard enough to shatter. Sometimes, the more complicated bars must be forged or built up by welding. The bar usually has a concave face to conform to the shape of the shop head to be made. When selecting a bucking bar, the first consideration is shape. Figure 4-83, if the bar does not have the correct shape, it deforms the rivet head. If the bar is too light, it does not give the necessary bucking weight, and the material may become bulged toward the shop head. If the bar is too heavy, its weight and the bucking force may cause the material to bulge away from the shop head. This tool is used by holding it against the shank end of a rivet while the shop head is being formed. Always hold the face of the bucking bar at right angles to the rivet shank. Failure to do so causes the rivet shank to bend with the first blows of the rivet gun and causes the material to become marred with the final blows. The bucker must hold the bucking bar in place until the rivet is completely driven. If the bucking bar is removed while the gun is in operation, the rivet set may be driven through the material. Allow the weight of the bucking bar to do most of the work and do not bear down too heavily on the shank of the rivet. The operator's hands nearly guide the bar and supply the necessary tension and rebound action. Coordinated bucking allows the bucking bar to vibrate in unison with the gun set. With experience, a high degree of skill can be developed. Defective rivet heads can be caused by lack of proper vibrating action, the use of a bucking bar that is too light or too heavy, and failure to hold the bucking bar at right angles to the rivet. The bars must be kept clean, smooth, and well polished. Their edges should be slightly rounded to prevent marring the material surrounding the riveting operation. Hand Rivet Set A hand rivet set is a tool equipped with a die for driving a particular type rivet. Rivet sets are available to fit every size and shape of rivet head. The ordinary set is made of 1-2 inch. Figure 4-82 Rivet Cutters Figure 4-83 Bucking Bars 4-36 Carbon tool steel about 6 inches in length and is knurled to prevent slipping in the hand. Only the face of the set is hardened and polished. Sets for universal rivets are recessed, or cupped, to fit the rivet head. In selecting the correct set, be sure it provides the proper clearance between the set and the sides of the rivet head, and between the surfaces of the metal and the set. Flush or flat sets are used for countersunk and flathead rivets. To seat flush rivets properly, be sure that the flush sets are at least one inch in diameter. Special draw sets are used to draw up the sheets to eliminate any opening between them before the rivet is bucked. Each draw set has a hole 132 inch larger than the diameter of the rivet shank for which it is made. Occasionally, the draw set and rivet header are incorporated into one tool. The header part consists of a hole shallow enough for the set to expand the rivet and head when struck with a hammer. Countersinking tool. The countersink is a tool that cuts a cone-shaped depression around the rivet hole to allow the rivet to set flush with the surface of the skin. Countersinks are made with angles to correspond with the various angles of countersunk rivet heads. The standard countersink has a 100 degrees angle, as shown in figure 4-84. Special micro-stop countersinks, commonly called stop countersinks, are available that can be adjusted to any desired depth, and have cutters to allow interchangeable holes with various countersunk angles to be made. Figure 4-85 Some stop countersinks also have a micrometer set mechanism, in 0.001 inch increments, for adjusting their cutting depths. Dimpling dies. Dimpling is done with a male and female die, punch and die set. The male die has a guide the size of the rivet hole and with the same degree of countersink as the rivet. The female die has a hole with a corresponding degree of countersink into which the male guide fits. Micro sleeve skirt. Eyelet. Locking ring. Cutter. Figure 4-85. Micro stop countersink. Power tools. The most common power tools used in riveting are the pneumatic rivet gun, rivet squeezers, and the micro shaver. Pneumatic rivet gun. The pneumatic rivet gun is the most common rivet upsetting tool used in airframe repair work. It is available in many sizes and types. Figure 4-86 The manufacturer's recommended capacity for each gun is usually stamped on the barrel. Pneumatic guns operate on air pressure of 90 to 100 pounds per square inch, and are used in conjunction with interchangeable rivet sets. Each set is designed to fit the specific type of rivet and the location of the work. The shank of the set is designed to fit into the rivet gun. An air-driven hammer inside the barrel of the gun supplies force to buck the rivet. Slow hitting rivet guns that strike from 900 to 2500 blows per minute are the most common type. Figure 4 87 These blows are slow enough to be easily controlled and heavy enough to do the job. These guns are sized by the largest rivet size continuously driven with size often based on the Chicago Pneumatic Company's old X series. A 4X gun, 8 or 1 4. 
100 degrees, 82 degrees, figure 4-84, counter 6, figure 4-86, rivet guns, 4-37, sliding valve, piston set sleeve, blank rivet set, exhaust deflector cylinder, beehive spring set retainer, throttle, trigger throttle lever throttle valve, throttle tube, pushing, regulator adjustment screw, air path, movement of air during forward stroke movement of air during rearward stroke, figure 4-87, Components of a rivet gun. Rivet is used for normal work. The less powerful 3X gun is used for smaller rivets and thinner structure. 7X guns are used for large rivets and thicker structures. A rivet gun should upset a rivet in 1 to 3 seconds. With practice, an aircraft technician learns the length of time needed to hold down the trigger. A rivet gun with the correct header rivet set must be held snugly against the rivet head and perpendicular to the surface, while a bucking bar of the proper weight is held against the opposite end. The force of the gun must be absorbed by the bucking bar and not the structure being riveted. When the gun is triggered, the rivet is driven. Always make sure the correct rivet header and the retaining spring are installed. Test the rivet gun on a piece of wood and adjust the air valve to a setting that is comfortable for the operator. The driving force of the rivet gun is adjusted by a needle valve on the handle. Adjustments should never be tested against anything harder than a wooden block to avoid header damage. If the adjustment fails to provide the best driving force, a different sized gun is needed. A gun that is too powerful is hard to control and may damage the work. On the other hand, if the gun is too light, it may work hard in the rivet before the head can be fully formed. The riveting action should start slowly and be one continued burst. If the riveting starts too fast, the rivet header might slip off the rivet and damage the rivet, smiley, or damage the skin, eyebrow. Try to drive the rivets within 3 seconds, because the rivet will work harder if the driving process takes too long. The dynamic of the driving process has the gun hitting, or vibrating, the rivet and material, which causes the bar to bounce, or counter vibrate. These opposing blows, low frequency vibrations, squeeze the rivet, causing it to swell, and then form the upset head. Some precautions to be observed when using a rivet gun are 1. Never point a rivet gun at anyone at any time. A rivet gun should be used for one purpose only, to drive or install rivets. 2. Never depress the trigger mechanism unless the set is held tightly against a block of wood or a rivet. 3. Always disconnect the air hose from the rivet gun when it is not in use for any appreciable length of time. 4-38. While traditional tooling has changed little in the past 60 years, significant changes have been made in rivet gun ergonomics. Reduced vibration rivet guns and bucking bars have been developed to reduce the incidence of carpal tunnel syndrome and enhance operator comfort. Rivet sets slash headers. Pneumatic guns are used in conjunction with interchangeable rivet sets or headers. Each is designed to fit the type of rivet and location of the work. The shank of the rivet header is designed to fit into the rivet gun. An appropriate header must be a correct match for the rivet being driven. The working face of a header should be properly designed and smoothly polished. They are made of forged steel, heat treated to be tough, but not too brittle. Flush headers come in various sizes. Smaller ones concentrate the driving force in a small area for maximum efficiency. Larger ones spread the driving force over a larger area and are used for the riveting of thin skins. Non-flush headers should fit a contact about the center two-thirds of the rivet head. They must be shallow enough to allow slight upsetting of the head and driving and some misalignment without eyebrowing the riveted surface. Care must be taken to match the size of the rivet. A header that is too small marks the rivet, while one too large marks the material. Rivet headers are made in a variety of styles. Figure 4-88 The short, straight header is best when the gun can be brought close to the work. Offset headers may be used to reach rivets in obstructed places. Long headers are sometimes necessary when the gun cannot be brought close to the work due to structural interference. Rivet headers should be kept clean. Compression riveting. Compression riveting, squeezing, is of limited value because this method of riveting can be used only over the edges of sheets or assemblies where conditions permit and where the reach of the rivet squeezer is deep enough. The three types of rivet squeezers hand, pneumatic, and hydraulic operate on the same principles. In the hand rivet squeezer, compression is supplied by hand pressure, in the pneumatic rivet squeezer, by air pressure, and in the hydraulic, by a combination of air and hydraulic pressure. One jaw is stationary and serves as a bucking bar, the other jaw is movable and does the upsetting. Riveting with a squeezer is a quick method and requires only one operator. These riveters are equipped with either a C-yoke or an alligator yoke in various sizes to accommodate any size of rivet. The working capacity of a yoke is measured by its gap and its reach. The gap is the distance between the movable jaw and the stationary jaw. The reach is the inside length of the throat measured from the center of the end sets. End sets for rivet squeezers serve the same purpose as rivet sets for pneumatic rivet guns and are available with the same type heads, which are interchangeable to suit any type of rivet head. One part of each set is inserted in the stationary jaw, while the other part is placed in the movable jaws. The manufactured head end set is placed on the stationary jaw whenever possible. During some operations, it may be necessary to reverse the end sets, placing the manufactured head end set on the movable jaw. Micro shavers. 
a microshaver is used if the smoothness of the material, such as skin, requires that all counter sun rivets be driven within a specific tolerance. Figure 4-89 This tool has a cutter, a stop, and two legs or stabilizers. The cutting portion of the microshaver is inside the stop. The depth of the cut can be adjusted by pulling outward on the stop and turning it in either direction, clockwise for deeper cuts. The marks on the stop permit adjustments of 0.001 inch. If the microshaver is adjusted and held correctly, it can cut the head of a counter sun rivet to within 0.002 inch without damaging the surrounding material. Figure 4-89 Microshaver Figure 4-88 Rivet Headers 4-39 Adjustments should always be made first on scrap material. When correctly adjusted, the microshaver leaves a small round dot about the size of a pinhead on the microshaved rivet. It may occasionally be necessary to shave rivets, normally restricted to MS-20426 head rivets, after driving to obtain the required flushness. Shear head rivets should never be shaved. Riveting Procedure The riveting procedure consists of transferring and preparing the hole, drilling, and driving the rivets. Hole Transfer Accomplish transfer of holes from a drilled part to another part, by placing the second part over first, and using established holes as a guide. Using an alternate method, scribe hole location through from drilled part onto part to be drilled, spot with a center punch, and drill. Hole preparation. It is very important, that the rivet hole be of the correct size, and shape and free from burrs. If the hole is too small, the protective coating is scratched from the rivet, when the rivet is driven through the hole. If the hole is too large, the rivet does not fill the hole completely. When it is bucked, the joint does not develop its full strength, and structural failure may occur at that spot. If countersinking is required, consider the thickness of the metal and adopt the countersinking method recommended for that thickness. If dimpling is required, keep hammer pose or dimpling pressures to a minimum so that no undue work hardening occurs in the surrounding area. Drilling. Rivet holes in repair may be drilled with either a light power drill or a hand drill. The standard shank twist drill is most commonly used. Drill bit sizes for rivet holes should be the smallest size, that permits easy insertion of the rivet, approximately 0.003 inch greater than the largest tolerance of the shank diameter. The recommended clearance drill bits for the common rivet diameters are shown in figure 4-90. Rivet diameter, in. Drill size pilot final. 3 slash 32. 1 slash 8. 5 slash 32. 3 slash 16. 1 slash 4. 3 slash 32, 0.0937, 1 slash 8, 0.125, 5 slash 32, 0.1562, 3 slash 16, 0.1875, 1 slash 4, 0.250, number 40, 0.098, number 30, 0.1285, number 21, 0.159, number 11, 0.191, F, 0.257, figure 4 90, drill sizes for standard rivets. Hole sizes for other fasteners are normally found on work documents, prints, or in manuals. Before drilling, center punch all rivet locations. The center punch mark should be large enough to prevent the drill from slipping out of position, yet it must not dent the surface surrounding the center punch mark. Place a bucking bar behind the metal during punching to help prevent denting. To make a rivet hole the correct size, first drill a slightly undersized hole, pilot hole. Ream the pilot hole with a twist drill of the appropriate size to obtain the required dimension. The drill, proceed as follows. One. Ensure the drill bit is the correct size and shape. 2. Place the drill in the center punch mark. When using a power drill, rotate the bit a few turns before starting the motor. 3. While drilling, always hold the drill at a 90 degrees angle to the work or the curvature of the material. 4. Avoid excessive pressure, let the drill bit do the cutting, and never push the drill bit through stock. 5. Remove all burrs with a metal counter sinker or file. 6. Clean away all drill chips. When holes are drilled through sheet metal, small burrs are formed around the edge of the hole. This is especially true when using a hand drill, because the drill speed is slow, and there is a tendency to apply more pressure per drill revolution. Remove all burrs with a burr remover or larger size drill bit before riveting. Driving the rivet. Although riveting equipment can be either stationary or portable, portable riveting equipment is the most common type of riveting equipment used to drive solid shank rivets in airframe repair work. Before driving any rivets into the sheet metal parts, be sure all holes line up perfectly, all shavings and burrs have been removed, and the parts to be riveted are securely fastened with temporary fasteners. Depending on the job, the riveting process may require one or two people. In solo riveting, the riveter holds a bucking bar with one hand, and operates a riveting gun with the other. If the job requires two aircraft technicians, a shooter, or gunner, and a bucker work together as a team to install rivets. An important component of team riveting is an efficient signaling system that communicates the status of the riveting process. This signaling system usually consists of tapping the bucking bar against the work, and is often called the tap. 4-40. Code. One tap may mean not fully seated, hit it again, while two taps may mean good rivet, and three taps may mean bad rivet, remove and drive another. Radio sets are also available for communication between the technicians. 
Once the rivet is installed, there should be no evidence of rotation of rivets or looseness of riveted parts. After the trimming operation, examine for tightness. Apply a force of 10 pounds to the trim stem. A tight stem is one indication of an acceptable rivet installation. Any degree of looseness indicates an oversized hole, and requires replacement of the rivet with an oversized shank diameter rivet. A rivet installation is assumed satisfactory when the rivet head is seated snugly against the item to be retained. 0.005 inch feeler gauge should not go under rivet head for more than one half the circumference, and the stem is proved tight. Countersunk rivets. An improperly made countersink reduces the strength of a flush riveted joint, and may even cause failure of the sheet or the rivet head. The two methods of countersinking commonly used for flush riveting in aircraft construction and repair are machine or drill countersinking, dimpling or press countersinking. The proper method for any particular application depends on the thickness of the parts to be riveted, the height and angle of the countersunk head, the tools available, and accessibility. Countersinking. When using countersunk rivets, it is necessary to make a conical recess in the skin for the head. The type of countersink required depends upon the relation of the thickness of the sheets to the depth of the rivet head. Use the proper degree and diameter countersink and cut only deep enough for the rivet head and metal to form a flush surface. Countersinking is an important factor in the design of fastener patterns, as the removal of material in the countersinking process necessitates an increase in the number of fasteners to assure the required load transfer strength. If countersinking is done on metal below a certain thickness, a knife edge with less than the minimum bearing surface or actual enlarging of the hole may result. The edge distance required when using countersunk fasteners is greater than when universal head fasteners are used. The general rule for countersinking and flush fastener installation procedures has been re-evaluated in recent years because countersunk holes have been responsible for fatigue cracks and aircraft pressurized skin. In the past, the general rule for countersinking held that the fastener head must be contained within the outer sheet. A combination of countersinks too deep, creating a knife edge, number of pressurization cycles, fatigue, deterioration of bonding materials, and working fasteners caused a high stress concentration that resulted in skin cracks and fastener failures. In primary structure and pressurized skin repairs, some manufacturers are currently recommending the countersink depth be no more than 2-3 the outer sheet thickness, or down to 0.020 inch minimum fastener shank depth, whichever is greater. Dimple the skin, if it is too thin for machine countersinking. Figure 4-91. Keep the rivet high, before driving to ensure the force of riveting is applied to the rivet, and not to the skin. If the rivet is driven, while it is flush or too deep, the surrounding skin is work hardened. Countersinking tools. While there are many types of countersink tools, the most commonly used has an included angle of 100 degrees. Sometimes types of 82 degrees or 120 degrees are used to form countersunk wells. Figure 4 84 A 6 fluted countersink works best in aluminum. There are also 4 and 3 fluted countersinks, but those are harder to control from a chatter standpoint. A single flute type, such as those manufactured by the Weldon Tool Company registered, works best for corrosion resistant steel. Figure 4 92 Preferred countersinking. Permissible countersinking. Unacceptable countersinking. Figure 4 91. Countersinking dimensions. 4 41. Figure 4 92. Single flute countersink. The micro stop countersink is the preferred countersinking tool. Figure 4 85. It has an adjustable sleeve cage that functions as a limit stop and holds the revolving countersink in a vertical position. Its threaded and replaceable cutters may have either a removable or an integral pilot that keeps the cutter centered in the hole. The pilot should be approximately 0.002 inch smaller than the hole size. It is recommended to test adjustments on a piece of scrap material before countersinking repair or replacement parts. Freehand countersinking is needed where a micro stop countersink cannot fit. This method should be practiced on scrap material to develop the required skill. Holding the drill motor steady and perpendicular is as critical during this operation as when drilling. Chattering is the most common problem encountered when countersinking. Some precautions that may eliminate or minimize chatter include Use sharp tooling. Use a slow speed and steady firm pressure. Use a piloted countersink with a pilot approximately 0.002 inch smaller than the hole. Use backup material to hold the pilot steady when countersinking thin sheet material. Use a cutter with a different number of flutes. Pilot drill an undersized hole, countersink, and then enlarge the hole to final size. Dimpling. Dimpling is the process of making an indentation or a dimple around the rivet hole to make the top of the head of a countersunk rivet flush with the surface of the metal. Dimpling is done with a male and female die, or forms, often called punch and die set. The male die has a guide the size of the rivet hole and is beveled to correspond to the degree of countersink of the rivet head. The female die has a hole into which the male guide fits and is beveled to a corresponding degree of countersink. When dimpling, press the female die on the solid surface. Then, place the material to be dimpled on the female die. Insert the male die in the hole to be dimpled and, with a hammer, strike the male die until the dimple is formed. Two or three solid hammer blows should be sufficient. A separate set of dies is necessary for each size of rivet and shape of rivet head. 
An alternate method is to use a counter sunk head ribbon instead of the regular male punch die, and a draw set instead of the female die, and hammer the ribbon until the dimple is formed. Dimpling dies for light work can be used in portable pneumatic or hand squeezers. Figure 4-93, if the dies are used with a squeezer, they must be adjusted accurately to the thickness of the sheet being dimpled. A table riveter is also used for dimpling thin skin material and installing rivets. Figure 4-94 coin dimpling. The coin dimpling, or coin pressing, method uses a counter sink rivet as the male dimpling die. Place the female die in the usual position, and back it with a bucking bar. Place the rivet of the required type into the hole, and strike the rivet with a pneumatic riveting hammer. Coin dimpling should be used, only when the regular male die is broken or not available. Coin pressing has the distinct disadvantage of the Figure 4-93 Hand squeezers 4-42 Male die Hole dimpled hole Female die 1-2-3 Bucking bar Figure 4-94 Table riveter Rivet hole needing to be drilled to correct rivet size before the dimpling operation is accomplished. Since the metal stretches during the dimpling operation, the hole becomes enlarged, and the rivet must be swelled slightly before driving to produce a close fit. Because the rivet head causes slight distortions in the recess, and these are characteristic only to that particular rivet head, it is wise to drive the same rivet that was used as the male die during the dimpling process. Do not substitute another rivet, either of the same size or a size larger. Radius dimpling. Radius dimpling uses special die sets that have a radius, and are often used with stationary or portable squeezers. Dimpling removes no metal and, due to the nestling effect, gives a stronger joint than the non-flush type. A dimpled joint reduces the shear loading on the rivet, and places more load on the riveted sheets. Note, dimpling is also done for flush bolts and other flush fasteners. Dimpling is required for sheets that are thinner than the minimum specified thickness for counter sinking. However, dimpling is not limited to thin materials. Heavier parts may be dimpled without cracking by specialized hot dimpling equipment. The temper of the material, rivet size, and available equipment are all factors to be considered a dimpling. Figure 4-95 Hot Dimpling Hot dimpling is the process that uses heated dimpling dies to ensure the metal flows better during the dimpling process. Hot dimpling is often performed with large stationary equipment available in a sheet metal shop. The metal being used is an important factor because each metal presents different dimpling problems. For example, 2024 T3 aluminum alloy can be satisfactorily dimpled either hot or cold, but may crack. Gun draw tool flat gun die. Figure 4-95. Dimpling techniques. In the vicinity of the dimple after cold dimpling, because of hard spots in the metal. Hot dimpling prevents such cracking. 7075 T6 aluminum alloys are always hot dimpled. Magnesium alloys also must be hot dimpled because, like 7075 T6, they have low formability qualities. Titanium is another metal that must be hot dimpled because it is tough and resists forming. The same temperature and dwell time used to hot dimple 7075 T6 is used for titanium. 100 degrees combination pre-dimple and countersink method. Metals of different thicknesses are sometimes joined by a combination of dimpling and countersinking. Figure 4-96 a countersink well made to receive a dimple is called a subcountersink. These are most often seen where this top sheet is dimpled. Thick bottom material is countersunk. Figure 4-96. Redimple and countersink method. 4-43. A thin web is attached to heavy structure. It is also used on thin gap seals, wear strips, and repairs for worn countersinks. Dimpling inspection. To determine the quality of a dimple, it is necessary to make a close visual inspection. Several features must be checked. The rivet head should fit flush, and there should be a sharp break from the surface into the dimple. The sharpness of the break is affected by dimpling pressure and metal thickness. Selected dimples should be checked by inserting a fastener to make sure that the flushness requirements are met. Cracked dimples are caused by poor dyes, rough holes, or improper heating. Two types of cracks may form during dimpling. Radial cracks start at the edge and spread outward as the metal within the dimple stretches. They are most common in 2024 T3. A rough hole or a dimple that is too deep causes such cracks. A small tolerance is usually allowed for radial cracks. Circumferential cracks downward bending into the draw, die causes tension stresses in the upper portion of the metal. Under some conditions, a crack may be created that runs around the edge of the dimple. Such cracks do not always show, since they may be underneath the cladding. When found, they are cause for rejection. These cracks are most common in hot dimpled 7075 T6 aluminum alloy material. The usual cause is insufficient dimpling heat. Evaluating the rivet. To obtain high structural efficiency in the manufacture and repair of aircraft, an inspection must be made of all rivets before the part is put in service. This inspection consists of examining both the shop and manufactured heads and the surrounding skin and structural parts for deformities. A scalar rivet gauge can be used to check the condition of the upset rivet head to see that it conforms to the proper requirements. Deformities in the manufactured head can be detected by the trained eye alone. Figure 4-97 
Some common causes of unsatisfactory riveting are improper bucking, rivet set slipping off, or being held at the wrong angle, and rivet holes or rivets of the wrong size. Additional causes for unsatisfactory riveting are countersunk rivets not flush with the well, work not properly fastened together during riveting, the presence of furs, rivets too hard, too much or too little driving, and rivets out of line. A. Driven correctly B. Unsteady tool C. Driven excessively D. Separation of sheet C. Unsteady rivet set F. Excessive shank length. Bottom view side view top view. Damaged head. Swelled shank. Cracked sloping head buckled shank. A B C. D. E. None. Cut head. Excessively flat head, resultant head cracks. Sheet separation. F. Imperfection cause remedy action. Sloping head. Buckled shank. None. Improperly held tools. Excessive driving, too much pressure on bucket bar. Work not held firmly together, and rivet shank swelled. A. Bucket bar not held firmly. B. Bucket bar permitted to slide and bounce over the rivet. Improper rivet length, and E above. Non hold riveting tools firmly against work improve riveting technique. Fasten work firmly together to prevent slipping. Hold bucket bar firmly without too much pressure. E above and rivet of proper length. Non replace rivet, replace rivet. Replace rivet. Replace rivet. Replace rivet. Figure 4 97. Rivet defects. 4-44. Occasionally, during an aircraft structural repair, it is wise to examine adjacent parts to determine the true condition of neighboring rivets. In doing so, it may be necessary to remove the paint. The presence of chipped or cracked paint around the heads may indicate shifted or loose rivets. Look for tipped or loose rivet heads. If the heads are tipped, or if rivets are loose, they show up in groups of several consecutive rivets, and probably tipped in the same direction. If heads that appear to be tipped are not in groups and are not tipped in the same direction, tipping may have occurred during some previous installation. Inspect rivets known to have been critically loaded, but that show no visible distortion, by drilling off the head and carefully punching out the shank. If, upon examination, the shank appears joggled and the holes in the sheet misaligned, the rivet has failed in shear. In that case, try to determine what is causing the shearing stress and take the necessary corrective action. Flush rivets that show head slippage within the countersink or dimple, indicating either sheet bearing failure or rivet shear failure, must be removed for inspection and replacement. Joggles and removed rivet shanks indicate partial shear failure. Replace these rivets with the next larger size. Also, if the rivet holes show elongation, replace the rivets with the next larger size. Sheet failures such as tear outs, cracks between rivets, and the like usually indicate damaged rivets. The complete repair of the joint may require replacement of the rivets with the next larger size. The general practice of replacing a rivet with the next larger size, 132 inch crater diameter, is necessary to obtain the proper joint strength of rivet and sheet when the original rivet hole is enlarged. If the rivet in an elongated hole is replaced by a rivet of the same size, its ability to carry its share of the shear load is impaired, and joint weakness results. Removal of rivets. When the rivet has to be replaced, remove it carefully to retain the rivet hole's original size and shape. If removed correctly, the rivet does not need to be replaced with one of the next larger size. Also, if the rivet is not removed properly, the strength of the joint may be weakened, and the replacement of rivets made more difficult. When removing a rivet, work on the manufactured head. It is more symmetrical about the shank than the shop head, and there is less chance of damaging the rivet hole or the material around it. To remove rivets, use hand tools, a power drill, or a combination of both. The procedure for universal or protruding head rivet removal is as follows. 1. File a flat area on the head of the rivet, and center punch the flat surface for drilling. Note. On thin metal, back up the rivet on the upset head, when center punching to avoid depressing the metal. 2. Use a drill bit one size smaller than the rivet shank to drill out the rivet head. Note. When using a power drill, set the drill on the rivet, and rotate the chuck several revolutions by hand, before turning on the power. This procedure helps the drill cut a good starting spot, and eliminates the chance of the drill slipping off and tracking across the metal. 3. Drill the rivet to the depth of its head, while holding the drill at a 90 degrees angle. Do not drill too deeply, as the rivet shank will then turn with the drill and tear the surrounding metal. Note. The rivet head often breaks away, and climbs the drill, which is a signal to withdraw the drill. 4. If the rivet head does not come loose of its own accord, insert a drift punch into the hole and twist slightly to either side until the head comes off. 5. Drive the remaining rivet shank out with a drift punch slightly smaller than the shank diameter. On thin metal or unsupported structures, support the sheet with a bucket bar while driving out the shank. If the shank is unusually tight after the rivet head is removed, drill the rivet about two-thirds through the thickness of the material and then drive the rest of it out with a drift punch. Figure 4-98 shows the preferred procedure for removing universal rivets. The procedure for the removal of countersunk rivets is the same as described above except no filing is necessary. Be careful to avoid elongation of the dimples or the countersunk holes. The rivet head should be drilled to approximately on of the thickness of the top sheet. The dimple in 2117T rivets usually eliminates the necessity of filing and center punching the rivet head. 
to remove a counter sunk or flush head rivet, you must 1. Select a drill about 0.003 inch smaller than the rivet shank diameter. 2. Drill into the exact center of the rivet head to the approximate depth of the head. 4-45. Rivet removal. Remove rivets by drilling off the head and punching out the shank as illustrated. 1. File a flat area on the manufactured head of non-flush rivets. 2. Place a block of wood or a bucking bar under both flush and non-flush rivets when center punching the manufactured head. 3. Use a drill that is 1 slash 32 0.0312 inch smaller than the rivet shank to drill through the head of the rivet. Ensure the drilling operation does not damage the skin or cut the sides of the rivet hole. 4. Insert a drift punch into the hole drilled in the rivet and tilt the punch to break off the rivet head. 5. Using a drift punch and hammer, drive out the rivet shank. Support the opposite side of the structure to prevent structural damage. 1. File a flat area on manufactured head 2. Center punch flat. 3. Drill through head using drill one size smaller than rivet shank. 4. Remove weakened head with machine punch. 5. Punch out rivet with machine punch. Figure 4-98. Rivet removal. 3. Remove the head by breaking it off. Use a punch as a lever. 4. Punch out the shank. Use a suitable backup, preferably wood, or equivalent, or a dedicated backup block. If the shank does not come out easily, use a small drill and drill through the shank. Be careful not to elongate the hole. Replacing rivets. Replace rivets with those of the same size and strength whenever possible. If the rivet hole becomes enlarged, deformed, or otherwise damaged, drill or ream the hole for the next larger size rivet. Do not replace a rivet with a type having lower strength properties unless the lower strength is adequately compensated by an increase in size or a greater number of rivets. It is acceptable to replace 2017 rivets of 316 inch diameter or less and 2024 rivets of 532 inch diameter or less with 2117 rivets for general repairs, provided the replacement rivets are 132 inch greater in diameter than the rivets they replace. National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, NACA, Method of Double Flush Riveting. A rivet installation technique known as the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, NACA, method has primary applications in fuel tank areas. Figure 4-99, to make a NACA rivet installation, the shank is upset into a 82 degrees counter sink. In driving, the gun may be used on either the 4-46, shop head formed in counter sink, rivet factory head. Figure 4-99, NACA riveting method, head or shank side. The upsetting is started with light blows, then the force increased, and the gunner bar moved on the shank end so as to form a head inside the counter sink well. If desired, the upset head may be shaved flush after driving. If utilizing this method, it is important to reference the manufacturer's instructions for repair or replacement. Special Purpose Fasteners Special Purpose Fasteners are designed for applications in which fastener strength, ease of installation, or temperature properties of the fastener require consideration. Solid shank rivets have been the preferred construction method for metal aircraft for many years because they fill up the hole, which results in good load transfer, but they are not always ideal. For example, the attachment of many non-structural parts, aircraft interior furnishings, flooring, the icing boots, etc. do not need the full strength of solid shank rivets. To install solid shank rivets, the aircraft technician must have access to both sides of a riveted structure or structural part. There are many places on an aircraft where this access is impossible or where limited space does not permit the use of a bucking bar. In these instances, it is not possible to use solid shank rivets, and special fasteners have been designed that can be bucked from the front. Figure 4-100 There are also areas of high loads, high fatigue, and bending on aircraft. Although the shear loads of riveted joints are very good, the tension or clamp up loads are less than ideal. Special purpose fasteners are sometimes lighter than solid shank rivets, yet strong enough for their intended use. These fasteners are manufactured by several corporations and have unique characteristics that require special installation tools, special installation procedures, and special removal procedures. Because these fasteners are often inserted in locations where one head, usually the shop head, cannot be seen, they are called blind rivets or blind fasteners. Typically, the locking characteristics of a blind rivet are not as good as a driven rivet. Therefore, blind rivets are usually not used when driven rivets can be installed. Blind rivets shall not be used. 1. In fluid tight areas. 2. On aircraft and air intake areas, where rivet parts may be ingested by the engine. 3. On aircraft control surfaces, hinges, hinge brackets, flight control actuating systems, wing attachment fittings, landing gear fittings, on floats or amphibian hulls below the water level, or other heavily stressed locations on the aircraft. Note. For metal repairs to the airframe, the use of blind rivets must be specifically authorized by the airframe manufacturer or approved by a representative of the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA. Blind rivets. 
The first blind fasteners were introduced in 1940 by the Cherry Rivet Company, now Cherry Registered Aerospace, and the aviation industry quickly adopted them. The past decades have seen a proliferation of blind fastening systems based on the original concept, which consists of a tubular rivet with a fixed head and a hollow sleeve. Inserted within the rivet's core is a stem that is enlarged or serrated on its exposed end when activated by a pulling type rivet gun. The lower end of the stem extends beyond the inner sheet of metal. This portion contains a tapered joining portion and a blind head that has a larger diameter than the stem or the sleeve of the tubular rivet. When the pulling force of the rivet gun forces the blind head upward into the sleeve, its stem upsets or expands the lower end of the sleeve into a tail. This presses the inner sheet upward and closes any space that might have existed between it and the outer sheet. Since the exposed head of the rivet is held tightly against the outer sheet by the rivet gun, the sheets of metal are clamped or clinched together. Figure 4-100 Assorted Fasteners 4-47 Note, fastener manufacturers use different terminology to describe the parts of the blind rivet. The terms mandrel, spindle, and stem are often used interchangeably. For clarity, the word stem is used in this handbook and refers to the piece that is inserted into the hollow sleeve. Friction locked blind rivets. Standard self-plugging blind rivets consist of a hollow sleeve and a stem with increased diameter in the plug section. The blind head is formed as the stem is pulled into the sleeve. Friction locked blind rivets have a multiple piece construction and rely on friction to lock the stem to the sleeve. As the stem is drawn up into the rivet shank, the stem portion upsets the shank on the blind side, forming a plug in the hollow center of the rivet. The excess portion of the stem breaks off at a groove due to the continued pulling action of the rivet gun. Metals used for these rivets are 2117 T4 and 5056F aluminum alloy. Mono registered is used for special applications. Many friction locked blind rivet center stems fall out due to vibration, which greatly reduces its sheer strength. To combat that problem, most friction lock blind rivets are replaced by the mechanical lock, or stem lock, type of blind fasteners. However, some types, such as the Cherry SPR registered 332-inch self-plugging rivet, are ideal for securing nut plates located in inaccessible and hard-to-reach areas where bucking or squeezing of solid rivets is unacceptable. Figure 4-102 Friction lock blind rivets are less expensive than mechanical lock blind rivets and are sometimes used for non-structural applications. Inspection of friction lock blind rivets is Figure 4-101 Friction Lock Blind Rivet Visual A more detailed discussion on how to inspect riveted joints can be found in the section General Repair Practices Removal of friction lock blind rivets consists of punching out the friction lock stem and then treating it like any other rivet Mechanical Lock Blind Rivets The self-plugging Mechanical Lock Blind Rivet was developed to prevent the problem of losing the center stem due to vibration This rivet has a device on the puller or rivet head that locks the center stem into place when installed Bolt, self-plugging, mechanically locked blind rivets form a large, blind head that provides higher strength than thin sheets when installed. They may be used in applications where the blind head is formed against a dimpled sheet. Manufacturers such as Cherry Registered Aerospace, Cherry Max Registered, Cherry Lock Registered, Cherry SST Registered, and Alcoa Fastening Systems, Huck Clinch Registered, Huck Max Registered, Unomatic Registered, make many variations of this of blind rivet. While similar in design, the tooling for these rivets is often not interchangeable. The Cherimax registered bulb blind rivet is one of the earlier types of mechanical lock blind rivets developed. Their main advantage is the ability to replace a solid shank rivet size for size. The Cherimax registered bulb blind rivet consists of four parts. 1. A fully serrated stem with brake notch, shear ring, and integral grip adjustment comb. 2. A driving handle to ensure a visible mechanical lock with each fastener installation. 3. A separate, visible, and inspectable locking collar that mechanically locks the stem to the rivet sleeve. 4. A rivet sleeve with recess in the head, to receive the locking collar. It is called a bulb fastener due to its large blind side bearing surface, developed during the installation process. These rivets are used in thin sheet applications, and for use in materials that may be damaged by other types of blind rivets. This rivet features a safe lock locking collar for more reliable joint integrity. The rough end of the retained stem in the center on the manufactured head, must never be filed smooth, because it weakens the strength of the lock ring, and the center stem could fall out. Cherimax registered bulb rivets are available in three head styles. Universal, 100 degrees countersunk, and 100 degrees reduced shear head styles. Their lengths are measured in increments of 1 16 inch. It is important to select a rivet with a length related to the grip length of the metal being joined. This blind rivet can be installed using either the Cherry Register G758 or the newly released Cherry Register G800 hand riveters, or either the pneumatic. 4-48 1, 2, 3, 4 The Cherimax registered rivet is inserted into the prepared hole. The pulling head, installation tool, is slipped over the rivet's stem. Applying a firm, steady pressure, which seats the rivet head, the installation tool is then actuated. The pulling head holds the rivet sleeve in place as it begins to pull the rivet stem into the rivet sleeve. This pulling action causes the stem shearing to upset the rivet sleeve and form the bulb blind head. 
The continued pulling action of the installation tool causes the stem shear ring to shear from the main body of the stem as the stem continues to move through the rivet sleeve. This action allows the fastener to accommodate a minimum of 1 16 variation in structure thickness. The locking collar then contacts the driving anvil. As the stem continues to be pulled by the action of the installation tool, the safe lock locking collar deforms into the rivet sleeve head recess. The safe lock locking collar fills the rivet sleeve head recess, locking the stem and rivet sleeve securely together. Continued pulling by the installation tool causes the stem to fracture at the brake notch, providing a flush, fur-free, inspectable installation. Figure 4-102. Jerry Max Registered Installation Procedure. Hydraulic G704B or G747 Jerry Max Registered Power Tools. For installation, please refer to Figure 4-102. The Jerimax registered mechanical lock line rivet is popular with general aviation repair shops because it features the one tool concept to install three standard rivet diameters and their oversized counterparts. Figure 4 103 Jerimax registered. Rivets are available in four nominal diameters 18, 532, 316, and 14 inch and three oversized diameters and four head styles. Universal, 100 degrees flush head, 120 degrees flush head, and NAS 1097. Flush head. This rivet consists of a blind header, hollow rivet shell, locking, foil, collar, driving anvil, and pulling stem complete with wrapped locking collar, the rivet sleeve and driving anvil, safe lock locking collar, pulling stem, rivet sleeve, bolt blind head, figure 4-103, Jeremax registered rivet, 4-49. The driving washer blind bolt header takes up the extended shank and forms the bucktail. The stem and rivet sleeve work as an assembly to provide radial expansion and a large bearing footprint on the blind side of the fastened surface. The lock collar ensures that the stem and sleeve remain assembled during joint loading and unloading. Rivet sleeves are made from 5056 aluminum, mono registered and INCO 600. The stems are made from alloy steel, crest, and INCO registered X750. Jeremax registered rivets have an ultimate shear strength ranging from 50 KSI to 75 KSI. Removal of mechanically locked blind rivets. Mechanically locked blind rivets are a challenge to remove because they are made from strong, hard metals. Lack of access poses yet another problem for the aviation technician. Designed for and used in difficult to reach locations means there is often no access to the blind side of the rivet or any way to provide support for the sheet metal surrounding the rivet's location when the aviation technician attempts removal. The stem is mechanically locked by a small lock ring that needs to be removed first. Use a small center drill to provide a guide for a larger drill on top of the rivet stem and drill away the upper portion of the stem to destroy the lock. Try to remove the lock ring, or use a prick punch or center punch to drive the stem down a little, and remove the lock ring. After the lock ring is removed, the stem can be driven out with a drive punch. After the stem is removed, the rivet can be drilled out in the same way as a solid rivet. If possible, support the back side of the rivet with a backup lock to prevent damage to the aircraft's skin. In fastening systems, high shear fasteners. A pin fastening system, or high shear pin rivet, is a two-piece fastener that consists of a threaded pin and a collar. The metal collar is swaged onto the grooved end, affecting a firm tight fit. They are essentially threadless bolts. High shear rivets are installed with standard bucking bars and pneumatic riveting hammers. They require the use of a special gun set that incorporates collar swaging and trimming, and a discharge port through which excess collar material is discharged. A separate size set is required for each shank diameter. Installation of high shear fasteners. Prepare holes for pin rivets with the same care as for other close tolerance rivets or bolts. At times, it may be necessary to spot face the area under the head of the pin to ensure the head of the rivet fits tightly against the material. The spot faced area should be 1 16 inch larger in diameter than the head diameter. Pin rivets may be driven from either end. Procedures for driving a pin rivet from the collar end are 1. Insert the rivet in the hole. 2. Place a bucking bar against the rivet head. 3. Slip the collar over the protruding rivet end. 4. Place previously selected rivet set and gun over the collar. Align the gun until it is perpendicular to the material. 5. Depress the trigger on the gun, applying pressure to the rivet collar. This action causes the rivet collar to swage into the groove on the rivet end. 6. Continue the driving action until the collar is properly formed, and excess collar material is trimmed off. Procedures for driving a pin rivet from the head end are. 1. Insert the rivet in the hole. 2. Slip the collar over the protruding end of rivet. 3. Insert the correct size gun rivet set in a bucking bar, and place the set against the collar of the rivet. 4. Apply pressure against the rivet head with a flush rivet set and pneumatic riveting hammer. 5. Continue applying pressure until the collar is formed in the groove, and excess collar material is trimmed off. Inspection. Pin rivets should be inspected on both sides of the material. The head of the rivet should not be marred, and should fit tightly against the material. Removal of pin rivets. The conventional method of removing rivets by drilling off the head may be utilized on either end of the pin rivet. Center punching is recommended prior to applying drilling pressure. In some cases, alternate methods may be needed. 
Grind the chisel edge on the small pin punch to a blade width of 1 8 inch. Place this tool at right angles to the collar and drive with a hammer to split the collar down one side. Repeat the operation on the opposite side. Then, with the chisel blade, pry the collar from the rivet. Tap the rivet out of the hole. Use a special hollow punch having one or more blades placed to split the collar. Pry the collar from the groove and tap out the rivet. Sharpen the cutting blades of a pair of nippers. Cut the collar in two pieces or use nippers at right angles to the rivet and cut through the small neck. 4-50. The hollow mill collar cutter can be used in a power hand drill to cut away enough collar material to permit the rivet to be tapped out of the work. The high shear pin rivet family includes fasteners, such as the high lock registered, high teak registered, and high light registered made by High Shear Corporation, and the Cherubic registered 95 KSI one piece shear pin and Cherry Easy Buck registered shear pin made by Cherry Registered. Aerospace. High lock registered fastening system. The threaded end of the high lock registered two piece fastener contains a hexagonal shaped recess. Figure 4 104 The hex tip of an Allen wrench engages the recess to prevent rotation of the pin while the collar is being installed. The pin is designed in two basic head styles. For shear applications, the pin is made in countersunk style and in a compact protruding head style. For tension applications, the MS24694 countersunk and regular protruding head styles are available. The self locking, threaded high lock registered collar has an internal counter bore at the base to accommodate variations in material thickness. At the opposite end of the collar is a wrenching device that is torqued by the driving tool until it shears off during installation, leaving the lower portion of the collar seated with the proper torque without additional torque inspection. This shear off point occurs when a predetermined preloader clamp up is attained in the fastener during installation. The advantages of high lock registered two piece fastener include its lightweight, high fatigue resistance, high strength, and its inability to be over torqued. The pins, made from alloy steel, erosion resistant steel, or titanium alloy, come in many standard and oversized shank diameters. The collars are made of aluminum alloy, erosion resistant steel, or alloy steel. The collars have wrenching flats, fracture point, threads, and a recess. The wrenching flats are used to install the collar. The fracture point has been designed to allow the wrenching flats to shear when the proper torque has been reached. The threads match the threads of the pins and have been formed into an ellipse that is distorted to provide the locking action. The recess serves as a built-in washer. This area contains a portion of the shank and the transition area of the fastener. The hole shall be prepared so that the maximum interference fit does not exceed 0.002 inch. This avoids buildup of excessive internal stresses in the work adjacent to the hole. The high lock registered pin has a slight radius under its head to increase fatigue life. After drilling, temper the edge of the hole to allow the head to seat fully in the hole. The high lock register is installed in interference fit holes for aluminum structure and a clearance fit for steel, titanium, and composite materials. High teak registered fastening system. The high teak registered fastener offers all of the benefits of the hillock registered fastening system along with a unique heat design that enhances the fatigue performance of the structure making it ideal for situations that require a controlled interference fit. The high teak registered fastener assembly consists of a pin and collar. These pin rivets have a radius at the transition area. During installation in an interference fit hole, the radius area will cold work the hole. These fastening systems can be easily confused, and visual reference should not be used for identification. Use part numbers to identify these fasteners. High Light Registered Fastening System The High Light Registered Fastener is similar in design and principle to the High Lock Registered Fastener, but the High Light Registered Fastener has a shorter transition area between the shank and the first load-bearing thread. High Light Registered has approximately one less thread. All Hillite registered fasteners are made of titanium. These differences reduce the weight of the high light registered fastener without lessening the shear strength, but the high light registered clamping forces are less than that of a high lock registered fastener. The high light registered collars are also different and thus are not interchangeable with high lock registered collars. High light registered fasteners can be replaced with high lock registered fasteners for most applications, but high locks registered cannot be replaced with high lights registered. Cherubic registered 95 KSI one piece shear pin. The Cherubic Registered is a bimetallic, one-piece fastener that combines a 95 KSI shear strength shank with a ductile, titanium columbium tail. Feces fasteners are functionally interchangeable with comparable 6AI4V titanium alloy two-piece shear fasteners, but with a number of advantages. Their one-piece design means no foreign object damage, FOD, it has a 600 degrees F allowable temperature, and a very low backside profile. Figure 4-104. High Lock Registered. 4-51. Lock bolt fastening systems. Also pioneered in the 1940s, the lock bolt is a two piece fastener that combines the features of a high strength bolt and a rivet with advantages over each. Figure 4 105 In general, a lock bolt is a non expanding fastener that has either a collar swaged into annular locking grooves on the pin shank or a type of threaded collar to lock it in place. 
Available with either counter stud or protruding heads. Lock bolts are permanent type fasteners assemblies and consist of a pin and a collar. A lock bolt is similar to an ordinary rivet in that the locking collar, or nut, is weak in tension and it is difficult to remove once installed. Some of the lock bolts are similar to blind rivets and can be completely installed from one side. Others are fed into the workpiece with the manufactured head on the far side. The installation is completed on the near side with a gun similar to blind rivet gun. The lock bolt is easier and more quickly installed than the conventional riveter bolt and eliminates the use of lock washers, cotter pins, and special nuts. The lock bolt is generally used in wing splice fittings, landing gear fittings, fuel cell fittings, long urines, beams, skin splice plates, and other major structural attachment. Often called hook bolts, lock bolts are manufactured by companies such as Cherry Registered Aerospace, Cherry Registered Lock Bolt, Elko Fastening Systems, Hook Tight Registered Lock Bolt System, and SPS Technologies. Used primarily for heavily stressed structures that require higher shear and clamp up values than can be obtained with rivets, the lock bolt and high lock registered are often used for similar applications. Lock bolts are made in various head styles, alloys, and finishes. The lock bolt requires a pneumatic hammer or pole gun for installation. Lock bolts have their own grip gauge, and an installation tool is required for their installation. Figure 4 106 When installed, the lock bolt is rigidly and permanently locked in place. Three types of lock bolts are commonly used pull type, stump type, and line type. Shear and tension pull type pins. Shear and tension stump type pins. Figure 4 105. Lock bolts 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22. 24, 26, 28, 30, 32, 34, 36, 38, 40, 42, 44, 46, 48, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32, 34, 36, 38, 40, 42, 44, 46, 48, inch scale grip scale, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32, 34, 36, 38, 40, 42, 44, 46, figure 4 106, lock bolt grip gauge. The pull type lock bolt is mainly used in aircraft and primary and secondary structure. It is installed very rapidly and has approximately one half the weight of equivalent and steel bolts and nuts. A special pneumatic pull gun is required for installation of this type lock bolt, which can be performed by one operator since buckling is not required. The stump type lock bolt, although not having the extended stem with pull proofs, is a companion fastener to the pull type lock bolt. It is used primarily where clearance does not permit effective installation of the pull type lock bolt. It is driven with a standard pneumatic riveting hammer, with a hammer set attached for swaging the collar into the pin locking grooves, and a bucking bar. The blind type lock bolt comes as a complete unit or assembly, and has exceptional strength and sheet pull together characteristics. Blind type lock bolts are used where only one side of the work is accessible and generally where it is difficult to drive a conventional rivet. This type lock bolt is installed in a manner similar to the pull type lock bolt. The pins of pull and stump type lock bolts are made of heat alloy steel or high strength aluminum alloy. Companion collars are made of aluminum alloy or mild steel. The blind type lock bolt consists of a heat treated alloy steel pin, blind sleeve, filler sleeve, mild steel collar, and carbon steel washer. These fasteners are used in shear and tension applications. The pull type is more common and can be installed by one person. The stump type requires a two person installation. An assembly tool is used to swage the collar onto the serrated grooves in the pin and break the stem flush to the top of the collar. The easiest way to differentiate between tension and shear pins is the number of locking grooves. Tension pins normally have four locking grooves, and shear pins have two locking grooves. The installation tooling preloads the pin while swaging the collar. The surplus end of the pin, called the pintail, is then fractured. Installation procedure. Installation of lock bolts involves proper drilling. The hole preparation for a lock bolt is similar to hole preparation for a 4-52 high lock register. An interference fit is typically used for aluminum, and a clearance fit is used for steel, titanium, and composite materials. Figure 4-107. Lock bolt inspection. After installation, a lock bolt needs to be inspected to determine if installation is satisfactory. Figure 4 108 inspect the lock bolt as follows 1. The head must be firmly seated. 2. The collar must be tight against the material and have the proper shape and size. 3. Pin protrusion must be within limits. Lock bolt removal. The best way to remove a lock bolt is to remove the collar and drive out the pin. 
The collar can be removed with a special collar cutter attached to a drill motor that mills off the collar without damaging the skin. If this is not possible, a collar splitter or small chisel can be used. Use a backup block on the opposite side to prevent a ligation of the hole. The Eddie Bolt Register 2 Pin Fastening System The Eddie Bolt Register 2 looks similar to the high lock registered, but has five flutes, equally spaced along a portion of the pin thread area. A companion threaded collar deforms into the flutes at a predetermined torque and locks the collar in place. The collar can be unscrewed using special tooling. This fastening system can be used in either clearance or interference fit holes. Line bolts. Bolts are threaded fasteners that support loads through pre-drilled holes. Hex, closed tolerance, and internal wrenching bolts are used in aircraft structural applications. Line bolts have a higher strength than line rivets and are used for joints that require high strength. Sometimes, these bolts can be direct replacements for the high lock register and lock bolt. Many of the new generation line bolts are made from titanium. RZ, Y, E. Lock bolt slash collar acceptance criteria. Nominal fastener diameter. YZ, ref. R max. 5 slash 32. 3 slash 16. 1 slash 4. 5 slash 16. 3 slash 8. E min. 0.324 slash 0.161. 0.280 slash 0.208. 0.374 slash 0.295 0.492 slash 0.404 0.604 slash 0.507 0.136 0.164 0.224 0.268 0.269 0.270 0.271 0.272 0.273 0.274 0.275 0.276 figure 4-108 lock bolt inspection 1, 2, 3, 4. Place the pin in the hole from the back side of the work and slip the collar on. The hold off head must be toward the gun. This allows the gun to preload the pin before slaging. Then apply the gun. The chuck jaws engage the pull grooves of the projecting pin tail. Hold the gun loosely and pull the trigger. The initial pull draws the work up tight and pulls that portion of the shank under the head into the hole. Further pull slages the collar into the locking grooves to form a permanent lock. Continued force breaks the pin and ejects the tail. Anvil returns and disengages from the slaged collar. Figure 4-107. Lock bolt installation procedure. 4-53. And rated at 90 KSI shear strength, which is twice as much as most blind rivets. Determining the correct length of the fastener is critical to correct installation. The grip length of a bolt is the distance from the underhead bearing surface to the first thread. The grip is the total thickness of material joined by the bolt. Ideally, the grip length should be a few thousandths of an inch less than the actual grip to avoid bottoming the nut. Special grip gauges are inserted in the hole to determine the length of the blind bolt to be used. Every blind bolt system has its own grip gauge and is not interchangeable with other blind bolt or rivet systems. Blind bolts are difficult to remove due to the hardness of the core bolt. A special removal kit is available from the manufacturer for removing each type of blind bolt. These kits make it easier to remove the blind bolt without damaging the hole and parent structure. Blind bolts are available in a pull type and a drive type. Pull type blind bolt. Several companies manufacture the pull type of blind bolt fastening systems. They may differ in some design aspects, but in general they have a similar function. The pull type uses the drive nut concept and is composed of a nut, sleeve, and a draw bolt. Frequently used blind bolt systems include, but are not limited to the Cherry Maxibolt registered blind bolt system and the Huck bolt registered fasteners which includes the T-Matic registered. Blind bolt and the Unimatic registered advanced bolt, UAB, blind bolt systems. Cherry Maxibolt registered blind bolt system. The Cherry Maxibolt registered blind bolt, available in alloy steel and A286 crest materials, comes in four different nominal and oversized head styles. Figure 4 1091 tool and pulling head installs all three diameters. The blind bolts create a larger blind side footprint, and they provide excellent performance in thin sheet and non metallic applications. A uh, flush breaking stem eliminates shaving, while the extended grip range accommodates different application thicknesses. Cherry Maxibolt's registered are primarily used in structures where higher loads are required. The steel version is 112 KSI shear. The A286 version is 95 KSI shear. The Cherry registered G83, G84, or G704 installation tools are required for installation. Huck line bolt system. The Huck line bolt is a high strength vibration resistant fastener. Figure 4 110. These bolts have been used successfully in many critical areas, such as engine inlets and leading edge applications. All fasteners are installed with a combination of available hand, pneumatic, hydraulic, or hydraulic pull type tools, no threads, for ease of installation. Huck line bolts can be installed on blind side angle surfaces up to 5 degrees without loss of performance. The stem is mechanically locked to provide vibration resistant, fog free installations. The locking collar is forced into a conical pocket between stem and sleeve, creating high tensile capability. The lock collar fills the sleeve lock pocket to prevent leakage or corrosion pockets, crevice corrosion. 
Flush headline bolts are designed to install with a flush stem brake that often requires no trimming for aerodynamic surfaces. The hookline bolt is available in high strength A286 crescent 95 KSI shear strength and 532 inch through 38 inch diameters in 100 degrees flush tension and protruding head. Also available are shear flush heads in 316 inch diameter. A286 crest hookline bolts are also available in 164 inch oversized diameters for repair applications. Drive the type of line bolt. Joe bolts, Visu lock registered, OC lock registered, OC bolt registered, and Rady lock registered fasteners use the drive nut concept and are composed of a nut, sleeve, and a draw bolt. Figure 4 111 These types of blind bolts are used for high strength applications in metals and composites when there is no access to the blind side. Available in steel and titanium alloys, A. During the maximal registered installation sequence, the cherry registered. Shift washer collapses into itself, leaving a solid washer that is easily retrieved. Figure 4 109. Max bolt registered blind bolt system installation. 4 54. Drive anvil washer. Gold color equals nominal diameter, silver color equals offset diameter. Breakneck expander. Bolt proof. Retention splines. Lock ring visible after installation. 1. Rivet inserted into clearance hole tool is engaged. Figure 4 111. Drive nut line bolt. 2. Expander enters sleeve upset starts to form. 3. Upset continues to form lock starts to form. 4. Upset complete lock completely formed. 5. Pin breaks flush, lock visible installation complete. Figure 4 110. Hook line bolt system. Are installed with special tooling. Both powered and hand tooling is available. During installation, the nut is held stationary while the core bolt is rotated by the installation tooling. The rotation of the core bolt draws the sleeve into the installed position and continues to retain the sleeve for the life of the fastener. The bolt has left hand threads and driving flats on the threaded end. A break-off relief allows the driving portion of the bolt to break off when the sleeve is properly seated. These types of bolts are available in many different head styles, including protruding head, 100 degrees flush head, 130 degrees flush head, and X head. Use the grip gauge available for the type of fastener and select the bolt grip after careful determination of the material thickness. The grip of the bolt is critical for correct installation. Figure 4-112. Installation Procedure. 1. Install the fastener into the hole, and place the installation tooling over the screw, stem, and nut. 2. Apply torque to the screw with the installation tool, while keeping the drive nut stationary. The screw continues to advance through the nut body causing the sleeve, to be drawn up over the tapered nose of the nut. When the sleeve forms tightly against the blind side of the structure, the screw fractures in the break groove. The stem of Joe bolts, Visu lock registered, and Composi lock registered two fasteners does not break off flush. Figure 4-112. Drive nut line bolt installation tool. 4-55. With the head. A screw break off shaver tool must be used if a flush installation is required. The stem of the newer Composi Lock 3 registered and OC bolt registered break off flush. Tapered shank bolt. Tapered shank bolts, such as the taper lock registered, are lightweight, high strength shear tension bolts. This bolt has a tapered shank designed to provide an interference fit upon installation. Tapered shank bolts can be identified by a round head, rather than a screwdriver slaughter wrench flats, and a threaded shank. The taper lock registered is comprised of a tapered, conical shank fastener installed into a precision tapered hole. The use of tapered shank bolts is limited to special applications such as high stress areas of fuel tanks. It is important that a tapered bolt not be substituted for any other type of fastener in repairs. It is equally as important not to substitute any other type of fastener for a tapered bolt. Tapered shank bolts look similar to high lock registered bolts after installation, but the tapered shank bolts do not have the hex recess at the threaded end of the bolt. Tapered shank bolts are installed in precision re-aimed holes, with a controlled interference fit. The interference fit compresses the material around the hole that results in excellent load transfer, fatigue resistance, and sealing. The collar used with the tapered shank bolts has a captive washer, and no extra washers are required. New tapered shank bolt installation or rework of tapered shank bolt holes needs to be accomplished by trained personnel. Properly installed, these bolts become tightly wedged and do not turn while torque is applied to the nut. Sleeve bolts. Sleeve bolts are used for similar purposes as tapered shank bolts, but are easier to install. Sleeve bolts, such as the two-piece sleeve bolt registered, consist of a tapered shank bolt and an expandable sleeve. The sleeve is internally tapered and externally straight. The sleeve bolt is installed in a standard tolerance straight hole. During installation, the bolt is forced into the sleeve. This action expands the sleeve which fills the hole. It is easier to drill a straight tolerance hole than it is to drill the tapered hole required for a tapered shank bolt. Rivet nut. The rivet nut is a blind installed, internally threaded rivet invented in 1936 by the Goodrich Rubber Company for the purpose of attaching a rubber aircraft wing de-icer extrusion to the leading edge of the wing. The original rivet nut is the rivet nut registered currently manufactured by Bolhoff Rivnut Inc. 
Rimna registered, became widely used in the military and aerospace markets because of its many design and assembly advantages. Rivet nuts are used for the installation of bearings, rim, and lightly loaded fittings that must be installed after an assembly is completed. Figure 4 113 often used for parts that are removed frequently. The rivet nut is available in two types. Under sunder flat head. Installed by crimping from one side, the rivet nut provides a threaded hole into which machine screws can be installed. Where a flush fit is required, the countersink style can be used. Rivet nuts made of alloy steel are used when increased tensile and shear strength is required. Hole preparation. Flat head rivet nuts require only the proper size of hole, while flush installation can be made into either countersunk or dimpled skin. Metal thinner than the rivet nut head requires a dimple. The rivet nut size is selected according to the thickness of the parent material and the size of screw to be used. The part number identifies the type of rivet nut and the maximum grip length. Recommended hole sizes are shown in figure 4-114. Correct installation requires good hole preparation, removal of burrs, and bolting the sheets in contact while heading. Like any sheet metal fastener, a rivet nut should fit snugly into its hole. Blind fasteners, non-structural, pop rivets. Common pull type pop rivets, produced for non-aircraft related applications, are not approved for use on certificated aircraft structures or components. However, some home-built non-certificated aircraft use pull type rivets for their structure. These types of rivets are typically made of aluminum and can be installed with hand tools. Figure 4-113. Rivet nut installation. Rivet nut registered size drill size hole tolerance. No. 4. No. 6. No. 8. 5 slash 32. Number 12. Number 2. 0.155.157 Figure 4-114 Recommended hole sizes for rivet nut 4-56 Hole through nut plate lined rivet Nut plate lined rivets are used where the high shear strength of solid rivets is not required or if there is no access to install a solid rivet The 332 inch diameter blind rivet is most often used The nut plate lined rivet is available with the pull throw and self plugging lock spindle Figure 4-115 The new cherry registered rivetless nut plate, which replaces standard riveted nut plates, features a retainer that does not require flaring. This proprietary design eliminates the need for two additional rivet holes, as well as re-aiming, counter-boring, and counter-sinking steps. Forming process Before a part is attached to the aircraft during either manufacture or repair, it has to be shaped to fit into place. This shaping process is called forming, and may be a simple process such as making one or two holes for attaching, it may be a complex process, such as making shapes with complex curvatures. Forming, which tends to change the shape or contour of a flat sheet or extruded shape, is accomplished by either stretching or shrinking the material in a certain area to produce curves, flanges, and various irregular shapes. Since the operation involves altering the shape of the stock material, the amount of shrinking and stretching almost entirely depends on the type of material used. Fully annealed, heated and cooled, material can withstand considerably more stretching and shrinking, and can be formed at a much smaller bend radius than when it is in any of the tempered conditions. When aircraft parts are formed at the factory, they are made on large presses or by drop hammers equipped with dies of the correct shape. Factory engineers, who designate specifications for the materials to be used to ensure the finished part has the correct temper when it leaves the machines, plan every part. Factory draftsmen prepare a layout for each part. Figure 4-116 Figure 4-115 Rivetless pull-through nut plate Figure 4-116 Aircraft formed at a factory Forming processes used on the flight line and those practiced in the maintenance or repair shop cannot duplicate a manufacturer's resources, but similar techniques of factory metal working can be applied in the handcrafting of repair parts. Forming usually involves the use of extremely light gauge alloys of a delicate nature that can be readily made useless by coarse and careless workmanship. A formed part may seem outwardly perfect, yet a wrong step in the forming procedure may leave the part in a strained condition. Such a defect may hasten fatigue, or may cause sudden structural failure. Of all the aircraft metals, pure aluminum is the most easily formed. In aluminum alloys, ease of forming varies with the temper condition. Since modern aircraft are constructed chiefly of aluminum and aluminum alloys, this section deals with the procedures for forming aluminum or aluminum alloy parts with a brief discussion of working with stainless steel, magnesium, and titanium. Most parts can be formed without annealing the metal, but if extensive forming operations, such as deep draws, large folds, or complex curves, are planned, the metal should be in the dead softer annealed condition. During the forming of some complex parts, operations may need to be stopped, and the metal annealed before the process can be continued or completed. For example, alloy 2024 in the zero condition can be formed into almost any shape by the common forming operations, but it must be heat treated afterward. Forming operations and terms. Forming requires either stretching or shrinking the metal, or sometimes doing both. Other processes used to form metal include bumping, crimping, and folding. 4-57 Stretching 
Stretching metal is achieved by hammering or rolling metal under pressure. For example, hammering a flat piece of metal causes the material in the hammered area to become thinner in that area. Since the amount of metal has not been decreased, the metal has been stretched. The stretching process thins, elongates, and curves sheet metal. It is critical to ensure the metal is not stretched too much, making it too thin, because sheet metal does not rebound easily. Figure 4-117 Stretching one portion of a piece of metal affects the surrounding material, especially in the case of formed and extruded angles. For example, hammering the metal in the horizontal flange of the angle strip over a metal block causes its length to increase, stretched, making that section longer than the section near the bend. To allow for this difference in length, the vertical flange, which tends to keep the material near the bend from stretching, would be forced to curve away from the greater length. Shrinking. Shrinking metal is much more difficult than stretching it. During the shrinking process, metal is forced or compressed into a smaller area. This process is used when the length of a piece of metal, especially on the inside of a bend, is to be reduced. Sheet metal can be shrunk in by hammering on the V-block, or by crimping, and then using a shrinking block. To curve the formed angle by the V-block method, place the angle on the V-block, and gently hammer downward against the upper edge directly over the V. While hammering, move the angle back and forth across the V-block to compress the material along the upper edge. Compression of the material along the upper edge of the vertical flange will cause the formed angle to take on the curved shape. The material in the horizontal flange will nearly bend down at the center, and the length of that flange will remain the same. Figure 4-118 to make a sharp curve or a sharply bent flanged angle, crimping and a shrinking block can be used. In this process, crimps are placed into one flange, and then by hammering the metal on the shrinking block, the crimps are driven, or shrunk, one at a time. Cold shrinking requires the combination of a hard surface, such as wood or steel, and a soft mallet or hammer, because a steel hammer over a hard surface stretches the metal, as opposed to shrinking it. The larger the mallet faces, the better. Pumping. Pumping involves shaping or forming malleable metal by hammering, or tapping usually with a rubber, plastic, or rawhide mallet. During this process, the metal is supported by a dolly, a sandbag, or a die. Each contains a depression into which hammered portions of the metal can sink. Pumping can be done by hand or by machine. Crimping. Crimping is folding, bleeding, or corrugating a piece of sheet metal in a way that shortens it or turning down the flange on the seam. It is often used to make one end of a piece of stove pipe slightly smaller, so that one section may be slipped into another. Crimping one side of a straight piece of angle iron with crimping pliers causes it to curve. Figure 4-119. Folding sheet metal. Folding sheet metal is to make a bend or crease in sheets, plates, or leaves. Folds are usually thought of as sharp, angular bends and are generally made on folding machines such as the box and pan brake discussed earlier in this chapter. Figure 4-117. Stretch forming metal. Figure 4-118. Shrink forming metal. 4-58. Figure 4-119. Crimping metal. Layout and...